Hello and welcome to The Daily Oz. I'm Emma. I'm Sam. Depression affects around one in every four young Aussie adults. We know that mental health conditions have surged among young people in recent years. We know depression can be triggered by environmental factors and life events. But there's still so much we don't know when it comes to the complex role of genetics in mental health disorders. It's what's motivated researchers from around the world to conduct the largest and most diverse study of its kind, aimed at understanding the link between biological factors and depression. Over six years, a team of researchers from around the world and here in Australia analysed nearly 700,000 genetic samples from 29 countries. The global study identified previously unknown genetic variants linked to depression. It could change the way depression is diagnosed and treated and proves that there is a strong biological basis to having the mental illness. Dr. Brittany Mitchell from the QIMR Berghofer Medical Research Institute was involved in that very study and she joins us from Queensland now to talk through these findings. Dr. Brittany Mitchell, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. We are talking today about this global study that you've been involved in. It's been described as an unprecedented study into the genetics of depression. Can you tell us a bit more about your involvement in this research and its scope? Yeah, so this was a big research project that came out of a consortium. And so that consortium is pretty much the pooling of anyone in the world that's working on the genetics of depression. We all decided uh, or came to the conclusion that For us to make any meaningful progress, we needed to kind of join forces, uh, pull our data together and our expertise uh, to to kind of combat what is a really complicated condition and really difficult to understand in terms of its etiology and its causes. Um, And so my contribution was leading the Australian arm of this study and contributing the data from uh, this side of the world. For those of us who are not genetics experts like Mm -hmm. you, What do we need to understand about genes? What are genetic variants? And what do these findings actually tell us? Yes, Yes. great question. Um, So we've known for quite a while that biology uh, plays a role in depression uh, causing. And so we've known that from long ago when uh, we saw that depression ran in families um, and that people that had a family history of depression had a, a higher likelihood of having it in their lifetime. But identifying the genes specifically that play a role has been a lot um, of a kind of slower process. And a lot of that comes from the fact that these genetic variants are really small in effect. And so each gene on its own plays a very small role in increasing our risk of depression. But then cumulatively, they all add up. Um, and so that's where we came to the uh, kind of realization that our sample sizes, when we were just looking kind of within Australia on our own or around the world, um, they weren't big enough for us to detect uh, these genetic variants that have such small effect sizes. And so that's that's what kind of motivated the pooling of the data that allowed us to find out what the genes are that make up this genetic component of depression risk. How big was that pool that you pulled data from what's the right size gene pool to really comprehensively be able to to prove that relationship between biology and depression yeah so it was uh, an incredibly large sample so we're very proud um, of everyone that's contributed and volunteered into the studies that have gone into it so we ended up analyzing the dna of 685,000 people that had had depression in their lifetime and then we had to compare their dna to people that had never had depression And so we had 4 million people that had volunteered that had never had depression. And it's from that comparison that we're able to find uh, so many of these genetic variants. I'm interested in particular in the genetics testing of non-European populations. I was really surprised Mm -hmm. to learn that that's not something that had really been conducted before in this space. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So this is a major shortfall of genetic research. It's not unique to depression genetics or mental health genetics at all. It's all genetic research into uh, human traits and diseases um, in that most of what we know has come from people from European ancestry backgrounds. Um, And the history as to why that is is very complicated. Um, 
And a lot of it's got to do with who was funding genetic research decades ago. But now we're at the point where if we, if we want our findings to matter um, and actually be meaningful to the population, we need to make sure that the science is representative of it. So this is the first study looking at the genetics of depression in diverse ancestries. And so looking across the board um, for as many different cultures as we could, um, pulling it together and then finding uh, genetic variants across everyone rather than subgrouping up to specific parts of the population. So of these nearly 700 genetic variants that the study has connected to depression, what does that mean in real terms if someone has one of these genes or one of those variants? Does that mean that they will experience depression? How should we interpret that? No, great question. So um, in reality, we will all have some of these variants. And so I like to look at it as kind of a continuum. And we we'll all sit somewhere in uh, how, how many of these variants we carry. But in reality, we'll all have some. And then it's only in the kind of very tail end of that where you have a lot of these variants that that actually ends up having um, a clinical effect on increasing your risk of depression. The idea of mental health conditions being tied to biology, there being hereditary factors, isn't necessarily a new discussion. But what do these findings specifically mean for our understanding of depression? And I'm interested in your perspective, both at a clinical level, but also from a social and cultural perspective. The thing that I hope comes across with this paper more than anything else is that we do show that depression has a biological basis. That doesn't mean for everyone the cause is the same. We know that there are many different causes for depression. We know that environment plays a very big role, lifestyle factors, uh, experiences, trauma. We know that those are very important and, uh, and for many people do cause depression irrespective of your genetics. But it does also, for some people, have this biological basis. And I think mental health in general, but also depression specifically, um, has for a very long time been very really stigmatized and quite often seen um, perhaps as a weakness um, or something that you shouldn't openly talk about or um, people often talk about being told to kind of snap out of it. And I think by showing quite concretely that there are um, these genes playing a role here, uh, that that might help that stigmatism a little bit and that it's taken seriously as a medical condition, you know, that is as biological as a lot of other things like diabetes. Uh, and so I hope this this helps study to kind of open that door to to taking it a little bit more seriously on and more being less stigmatized and easily talked about. So these findings play a role potentially in empowering more people. What about in terms of treatments? How could this evidence be used to change the way we diagnose or treat depression? So in terms of treatment, um, we're really excited by um, two avenues. And the one is, you know, by understanding the biology and knowing what's going on in the brain, this gives us a clearer understanding of how depression is coming about and how what's causing it. Um, and that gives us new targets that you can then look for new drugs or medications that may help depression. Um, and along those similar lines, what we've done in the study uh, because we now know or have a clearer idea of these pathways, we've been able to identify drugs that are already on the market um, that treat other conditions. So one of the ones mentioned in the paper is um, called modafinil. It's used often to treat narcolepsy or prescribed to shift workers that uh, need to stay awake during the night. And it really helps with kind of alertness and, and fatigue. And we've shown that that medication targets a lot of the same pathways that um, are enriched in people that have depression. And, and it kind of makes sense if you start to think about a lot of the symptoms of depression also include um, difficulty sleeping or difficulty getting up in the morning and lack of motivation. And so um, if we're able to use those drugs, we, it's already available, it's safe. Um, that would really shorten the time frame between uh, getting it to people um, that have depression and might be useful because they're not responding to the current antidepressant medications. So it's not necessarily about reinventing the wheel or months or years of trials and testing. 
there could be drugs on the market right now that could easily be repurposed. Hello, Billy here from TDA. We have just looked at our YouTube analytics and 95% of you who are watching our videos aren't subscribing. If you want to help independent media like us grow, the best way you can do that is by pressing subscribe. Thank you so much and back to the video. Yes, potentially. So uh, we're very excited about that. We yeah, by no means want everyone to go out and, and buy modafinil now if they're suffering from depression. Um, but it would be a very promising aspect and that's that's really kind of one of the next steps we want to take and to, to see if we can do that. Will this changing understanding of the role of genetics in depression be meaningful for treatment-resistant depression or what we've previously thought of as treatment-resistant depression? It's something we've spoken to our audience about before. It's something we know a huge portion of people with depression have experienced what does this mean for that space? Yeah, absolutely. So I think that's something um, that I also personally am really interested in, um, in understanding who responds to treatment and who doesn't. Um, and we know that a very large portion of people don't respond to at least their first medication. Um, and then that goes on. And, and as you say, then we get people that don't seem to respond to any types of um, currently available medications um, or other forms of treatment. What we don't really understand is why. Why does uh, an SSRI antidepressant work for one person and doesn't work for the other? Um, or why can some people try five, ten different types of medication and never find that they, that helps for them? Um, and we hypothesize that this could at least be in part by, uh, due to biology, due to a person's genetic makeup. And if we can understand that, we can help try and match people with more effective medications sooner. Could, hypothetically, researchers apply the same approach as they did with this genetic variant depression study to understanding other mental health conditions? Absolutely. So that, that's ongoing. Um, part of this consortium that I mentioned, the Psychiatric Genetics Consortium, they have uh, work groups and each of those work groups concentrate on different uh, mental health conditions so this is the outcome from the depression work group but there's equally a bipolar disorder work group and a schizophrenia work group and an anxiety disorders work group so uh, there are a lot of people working on this what are the next steps from here how might these findings and you know the future findings from these other working groups that you've touched on be used to create tangible change for the lives of people with mental health conditions? The ultimate goal is that we can start to incorporate uh, genetic profiles or genetic information in general health care. And so both from a preventative measure, if you know, you're able to, to do a test that, that profiles your genetic risk of mental health conditions, you can then work with healthcare providers uh, to try and mitigate risks or Potentially, you know, if you know you're at a high risk of having depression and you go through a really traumatic event, um, that that can you can help try uh, mitigate risks from that by uh, seeking professional help earlier potentially. Um, and while we're still way off that, we're hoping that that uh, does come to fruition. Um, at least, hopefully, in my lifetime. <laughs> And uh, uh, there's also a lot to consider in terms of legal frameworks, ethical frameworks. You know, once you've got a person's genetic information, um, there's a lot of safeguards that are needed on what happens with that information. But I think there's also a lot of um, exciting prospects going forward on what we can do with that. Um, and then on the flip side, on better treatments and matching people to better treatments so they don't have to go to the doctor and, and get prescribed a certain medication and then told to wait six to 12 weeks and see if that gets better. And if it doesn't, then we just try you on a different medication. And that's a really long time for someone that's uh, suffering uh, to just be told to kind of sit and wait. So we hope we can improve that. The Australian Genetics of Depression Study is still recruiting new participants. So if someone is listening and wanting to get involved, how do they go about that? What are you guys sort of looking for? or Who are you hoping to recruit? Absolutely. Um, so we're very proud of our contribution. Um, we were one of the biggest cohorts in the world that went into the study, um, and that came from the Australian Genetics of Depression study, where uh, people, you know, volunteered and shared their experiences of depression. So 
Um, it's the study website's very easy to find if you Google it or you go to geneticsofdepression.org.au um, and it explains what the study's about and how you go about it. Um, we're really looking to continue to expand our sample sizes. Uh, as I've said, depression is incredibly complicated. It looks very different from one person to another. And so for us to understand why this is, we need as representative uh, sample as we can of the different experiences. And so if we can get anyone that's interested or you know someone that um, has depression that might be interested, regardless of your background or your age or whether medication's worked for you or hasn't worked for you, we'd be very, very happy to hear from you. That's all we've got time for on today's episode. A big thank you to QIMR Berghofer researcher, Dr. Brittany Mitchell, for joining us to explain those findings. Now, if you learned something from today's episode, don't forget to hit subscribe where you listen or watch The Daily Oz. If you're watching on YouTube, hello. We are really enjoying being here in 2025. We're going to be back a little later today with the latest news headlines. But until then, have a great day.